I'm Kate Alexandrova. Welcome to Green TV, the show dedicated to positive Green New Deal style solutions and the independent Green and Green Party candidates that advocate for them. Here with us today is Gail Farrell Parker and Amy Harfold. Green TV and the independent Green Party advocates for jobs, ecologically aware jobs for the economy, solar jobs, wind jobs, geothermal energy jobs, rail jobs, conservation jobs, and weatherization jobs. More Virginians work in solar jobs than in coal, some 11,000 statewide. Before we talk with our guest, we have an exciting short video to show you. ...in New York as a case study and basically found that um, going to 100% wind, water, and sun by 2030 was going to pay for itself simply in health savings alone. Uh, we sort of take air pollution for granted and water pollution and things like that. We take it for granted and assume that these are God-given conditions, that we all live with heart disease and, and respiratory disease and the other uh, consequences, asthma and so on. These are just like natural parts of human society. In fact, they're not. They're not supposed to be God-given conditions that strike us really from, uh, from birth on. These aren't just dis diseases of aging. They hit children as much as anyone else. So the, your point is a very good one, that there are so many um, benefits to greening our economy, uh, to halting climate change, to making wars for oil obsolete, and above all, to providing those jobs right now that are essential. We can make unemployment a thing of the past. And now we turn to Gail Parker, who will introduce our guest. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I'm, we're fortunate today to have Amy Hartfeld in the studio with us. Uh, Amy serves as the National Policy Director for the, uh, and the Senior Staff Attorney uh, for the Children's Advocacy Institute. Uh, the uh, Ch Children's Advocacy Institute is based in uh, California and uh, also has an office here in Washington, D.C. And Amy uh, was kind enough to join us tonight. Um, Amy, we, we understand that the Institute does a lot of legislative work to uh, help protect children. And we would like to know um, about your legislative initiatives, uh, a little bit about your organization, uh, some of the uh, things that you would like for jo Dr. Stein to advocate for and uh, for our candidates to advocate for. So, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, about your initiative? Sure. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so my work is with the Children's Advocacy Institute, which is based out of the University of San Diego School of Law. The founder of my organization is Professor Bob Felmuth, who is one of the original Nader's Raiders from the 1960s. Oh. Um, Professor Felmuth founded two different nonprofit organizations at the University of San Diego. The um, Center for Public Interest Law, which mostly does class action litigation and advocacy around environmental issues and consumer protection, as well as the Children's Advocacy Institute, which is located in the same building um, and does work essentially protecting the rights and strengthening the rights of children who have been abused and neglected, who are at risk of being abused and neglected, and with a special focus on older youth who are still in the foster care system and unlikely to be adopted. We work very hard to try to make sure that if they are not adopted into permanent families, that they have a good chance for success um, during life as an independent person, hopefully um, on their own, as they leave the system. I see. It sounds like very rewarding work. How did you get into, into this um, advocacy? I, um, my career in advocacy started out with Teach for America. I was one of the first core members to graduate from um, the Teach for America program. I started in 1994, and I taught in inner city Los Angeles for three years. I taught seventh grade. And I had a student um, who was suffering horrible abuse and neglect and who I had a close relationship with and ended up um, calling in a case to CPS and testifying at his hearing. And that left a very deep impression on me that I wanted to get involved in this work more deeply. I see. Well, it must be very uh, rewarding. Um, Tell me, I, I'm interested in knowing what type of uh, child 
is brought into the system for protection? Uh, what sort of situations would bring a child into the system? Sure. Child abuse itself is a very equal opportunity offender. Um, in terms of race, class, socioeconomic position, there's not a lot of distinction regarding how many children actually suffer abuse. But in terms of the children who actually come into the system, um, those children end up being disproportionately children of color and poor children. Um, the reason for this is that people who serve as mandated reporters who are required by law to report on suspicions of child abuse are state employees. And so people who have less resources and who are more dependent on public services such as public hospitals, Medicaid and Medicare, um, food stamps, uh, disability benefits perhaps, um, and other public uh, services and public officials, the more public officials you have contact with, the more chance there is for somebody to become suspicious of um, something going on in your home. So does that mean that uh, there are children uh, from families that are more wealthy that simply fall through the cracks? Absolutely. It's, it's very similar to domestic violence. Um, domestic violence impacts almost all populations fairly equally. Um, but because domestic violence, like child abuse, happens behind closed doors within a family, um, it's very rarely reported. So the numbers that we have on child abuse rates in America, we believe, just like domestic violence, are just a, a very small fraction of what's actually happening. All right. I know that you recently put together a very disturbing report uh, regarding the state of affairs in your field. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Uh, we've been doing this work for a very long time. I myself have been doing it for over 20 years. And we became increasingly frustrated that we were identifying and working to change small parts of a broken system. The more we've done this work, the more we've realized that it's not a matter of little parts of a system that are broken. The whole system is broken. And so we really took a step back to get the 30,000-foot view and identified the responsibilities, actions, and shortcomings of all three branches of our federal government in terms of how they are serving this population of children, what their duties are, what they should be doing, and how they can improve their actions. Uh, isn't it one of the, I guess, dichotomies that, that uh, if, if a state is found not to be using their resources in the best way, that um, by stopping the resources then in these programs, it really hurts the population that you're trying to serve. Isn't that correct? Isn't that? So our argument is that that's not correct. Oh. Um, federal, the child welfare financing is complicated. Generally speaking, um, the federal government spends about $9 billion a year on, on child welfare nationally. In terms of how it impacts states, Generally speaking, the federal government's um, contribution to their child welfare system makes up about 40 to 50 percent of what states are getting in terms of the cost of their child welfare systems. So when we accuse the federal government of failing to do their duty in terms of overseeing and enforcing federal law, the response that we get from those who don't want them to be held accountable is, oh, but if you have sanctions against states for failing to comply with the law, or if you impose financial penalties on them, either they will, they will no longer wish to receive federal money because there's too much responsibility on them for so few dollars, and it's very few dollars, which is one of the problems, and it's true, or you'll be removing benefits and services from the population you're trying to help. We have, that, that has not borne out in the results that we've seen in states. States have not refuse to accept this money. They continue to take it. They need it. And when sanctions are imposed or penalties are levied against states for not following the law, they get their act together pretty quickly. Oh, that's good news. And in terms of the legislation, are you happy with the current laws? And uh, I understand that you're trying to advance uh, the agenda of your organization uh, in uh, you know, the Congress. In Congress and across the government. Yeah, let me lay out the broad framework of the report that's been published. The report is entitled Shame on Us, 
Um, failings by all three branches of federal government leave abused and neglected children vulnerable to f further harm. So we start with Congress, and we identify um, the array of federal laws that relate to child welfare. The long and short of it is that the laws that we have are weak, are grossly underfunded, and are totally disjointed within the Congress. So for example, the two biggest child welfare programs in this country are Title IV-E and IV-B of the, of the Social Security Act and the uh, Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. Those are the, the primary sources of child welfare um, legislation. The Senate Finance Committee has jurisdiction over the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, while the Senate Health Committee, Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee has jurisdiction over Title IV-E and IV-B. So any logical reason for them to collaborate to the, for the benefit of children um, who have been abused and neglected is simply, is simply not done because they won't cooperate with each other. They won't speak to each other. They won't share jurisdiction over these laws. And that's just a symptom of, of how, how, how bad things are up on the Hill when different committees in the same House of our Congress can't collaborate to benefit our most vulnerable citizens. So that's what's happening in Congress. Then we, we draw our attention to the executive branch. And the agency responsible for enforcing and overseeing um, federal child welfare law is the Department of Health and Human Services. They themselves are, of course, underfunded to do their work. So they're the only agency that has the authority and the responsibility for making sure that federal dollars are accounted for, for making sure that they're well spent, and for making sure that the children who are supposed to be protected by these laws are in fact being protected. And what we found again and again and again is that in the very scant reviews that the federal agency does of implementation and enforcement of these laws that no state has ever been found to comply with any review they've ever done. All 50 states have been found grossly out of compliance with every review they've ever done. And they have never imposed meaningful sanctions or penalties against any state. So what that means is that we have this tantamount complicit relationship between the states and the federal government in failing to protect these children who, of course, are not only children, but are children who've been hurt by the only people who are able to and responsible for really protecting them. So uh, who's the main culprit, in your opinion? I'm not even done with the culprits. We, <laughs> <laughs> we then draw our attention to the federal courts, because that's our third branch of government. And what we found is that states have so consistently failed to enforce the law that in over half of the states in this country, there have been federal lawsuits filed against the state for failing to serve those children under federal and state law. Um, this, this litigation is very costly, very, very time consuming, and very difficult to undertake. And it has resulted in almost every case with um, orders from the court that, that the state must comply with certain, um, certain requirements over a period of time. And these consent decrees are implemented and overseen every one to two years. So many states have been under a consent decree for 10, 20, 30, 35 years, and they still haven't brought their systems up to par. So if this, that's not disturbing enough on its own, the courts have started to turn away these cases. So they have started to say that children lack standing to bring the cases or that they're relying on a doctrine of abstention, saying that it's state court business and they don't want to get involved. So if the federal, if Congress is failing to enact strong enough legislation and HHS is failing to enforce the law adequately and the courts are shutting their doors to these children, they are really left out in the cold. That said, uh, I must know that you're not the only person who's not happy with Congress these days. Uh, another one is uh, Mr. Richard Harnish, Executive Director of the Midwest High Speed Rail Association, and that is right up your alley, Gail. Yes. Some disturbing news here. Um, the bill proposed by the House of Transportation and Infrastructure Committee will not provide the National Rail Network 
Our economy needs to thrive in the 21st century, states Harnish. He also says the proposed bill would authorize Amtrak and other intercity passenger rail service at only 1.8 billion per year. That means another five years of declining service when the system should be rapidly growing. End of a quote. The Federal Railroad Administration has established that $5 billion per year is the minimum required to grow the system, while the American Public Transportation Association has shown that $9.5 billion per year is needed to support the current infrastructure project pipeline and continue Amtrak's funding. The National Association of Railroad Passengers has identified nearly $200 billion, that's 20 times more in projects requested by state or local governments to improve safety and service. Harnish says Congress needs to do a lot better. This proposal for insufficient funding comes at a time when Amtrak ridership is rapidly growing. As more and more Americans turn towards intercity trains, Congress is failing to plan for the future. Harnish says Every year that passes without an investment in expanding our system is another year we fall behind our competitors in Europe and Asia. What do you think about that, Gail? Well, it's very disappointing news, Kate. Uh, and also, uh, these, the opportunity for jobs, I believe, uh, may play into the abuse uh, these families experience is, is that not true, Amy? If uh, these families uh, had were employed with good-paying jobs, do you find that um, there's a, um, a correlation between? There is there is certainly an intersection, an unfortunate intersection between issues of poverty and issues of child maltreatment. There are a lot of families who have come to the attention of the system for neglecting their children because they're poor. And of course, issues regarding employment and transportation are two very important issues that, that keep a lot of families poor. So for example, you might have a single mom raising several kids, and they're different ages. One is in high school, one is in elementary school, and one goes to a, a Head Start program. Somehow, she needs to get all three of those kids safely to school and get herself to work with no car. So if there's not a reliable rail system for her to be able to do that, one of her kids might end up staying at home. And then guess what? She's guilty of educational neglect. Um, an, an issue that rail would fix, un undoubtedly. <laughs> uh, Amy Harfeld. Uh, the National Policy Director and Senior Staff uh, Attorney for the Children's Advocacy Institute at the University of San Diego School of Law is here with us today. And uh, Amy, would you please uh, share uh, your website with us? Sure. The Children's Advocacy Institute can be found at chichildlaw.org. That's C-A-I childlaw.org. You can find information on a state-by-state -state basis, as well as the report that we mentioned today, Shame on Us, um, which we hope that you will take a look at and get angry about and do something about. What is the most burning issue right now? Right now, we are very concerned about um, making sure that the um, Department of Health and Human Services actually complies with outstanding orders from Congress to enact regulations to better protect these kids. There's been, there have been years um, that have gone by with Congress directly ordering them to issue regulations, and they simply have, have just flagrantly refused to enact these regulations, which are the only way for people like me to hold them accountable, because if there are no regulations, we can't sue them. So as soon as enforceable regulations are enacted, when we learn that they're not doing what they need to do, organizations like mine, legal advocacy organizations, can of course sue them, which we've seen works very well in consumer rights and other advocacy communities, but you have to have a basis to hold agencies accountable. I, that's very good. Bef uh, while we have the opportunity, I would like to uh, point out to our viewers that we have candidates that are petitioning uh, at this very moment to get on the ballot for 2015, and I would like to give them a shout out uh, individually. There's uh, Aaron Lyles, 
in Roanoke, Virginia. And do we have some pictures uh, to show the viewers? Yes, uh, that's uh, Aaron Lyles, young man. He's going to be on the show uh, shortly, sometime soon. We also have Mr. Uh, Albert Burkhart. Colonel Albert Burkhart is uh, from Smithville, Virginia, and he's running for Board of Supervisors. Can we see Mr. Uh, or Colonel Albert Burkhart? Next picture. There's Albert with a flag behind him. Great guy. And our own uh, Carrie Campbell is a candidate for uh, Braddock District Board of Supervisor. We also have Colonel Jim Leslie, who is running for office. And um, down south, we have Dr. Ken Hildebrand and his wife, Elaine, who've been on our show before. Uh, I, yours truly, am also running for office, Gail Farrell Parker, um, for Board of Supervisors. Janet Farrell Murphy is also uh, a candidate. Marissa Wasar is uh, also running in the, um, I believe it's Sully District for Board of Supervisors. Tariq Salahi is also one of our candidates petitioning to get on the ballot. Tariq Salahi, do we have a picture of Tariq? There he is, handsome dude. Uh, we also have Terry Modulin. Uh, Terry Modulin, looks like uh, our graphics person needs to, uh, there, anyway, that's uh, Terry Modulin is also petitioning. And we have uh, Dudeski, Steve Poshur. Do we have a picture of Steve? There he is, Dudeski. My neighbor. Dudeski. I think it's Dudeski. <laughs> Dudeski. So uh, please uh, sign our, the petitions if you uh, have an opportunity the, for these <coughs> candidates. And uh, we look forward to seeing them on the ballot and this year and probably again next year. This is Green TV, and uh, here with us is Amy Harfield, uh, the National Policy Director and Senior Staff Attorney for the Children's Advocacy Institute at the University of San Diego School of Law. Amy, take two minutes and tell us the single most important thing you'd like for our viewers to know. I think we all need to remember that the, one of the most vulnerable populations of citizens in this country are a group that are literally disenfranchised. They do not, children do not vote, they do not pay taxes, and they don't have lobbyists on the Hill. In fact, when I go into offices to lobby Congress to pass legislation to better protect those youth, I am always met by staffers who say, oh, I, I didn't know that there were lobbyists who did this kind of work. So it's very important for us to remember that this group who is so vulnerable and so needy and doesn't have their parents to look after them, because often those are the very people who have hurt them, they need our protection. And they need us to realize that when children are in foster care, we are their parents. As taxpayers, we pay for the foster care that houses and feeds and clothes them. So in a sense, they're our children, every one of us. And it's our responsibility to know what kind of parents we are and how our children are doing. So um, do, do you have any noticeable cases that you would like to tell us about? Of course, without uh, calling any real names, uh, but what would you name the biggest success, uh, biggest recent success, um, of your sure. organization. Um, we, had, we had a rare and very wonderful piece of legislation passed this September. Um, it was actually a sex trafficking bill, but it included a provision that we've worked on for years. Um, and this is going to seem um, like an obvious thing to, to your viewers and, and to you, but when children age out of the foster care system when they turn 18, many of them don't have the basic documents they need to start life on their own. And so this bill, which was passed in Congress just this past, um, this past year, this fall, requires that when children leave foster care without having been adopted, that they are provided with a copy of their birth certificate, their social security card, their health and medical information, um, a letter of proof of their stay in foster care, a driver's license or state-issued ID, um, and some other important documents that you would 
we don't realize how important they are to us in starting our lives when we're young until we don't have them. So we finally have uh, legislation requiring the states to do this. Of course, now it's up to HHS to actually enact that legislation well, and that enforce it against the terrific states. terrific job on your part, regardless of anything. Amy Harfeld, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your public service and for your efforts uh, to fight for abused and neglected children and uh, make the country the better place to live. And thank you for taking your time and joining us at Green TV. Thank you so much. Stay with us while we show a short clip on High Speed Rail. to Gail Parker and Amy Harfeld for being with us today on Green TV and thank you for tuning in. Join us again as we bring you more positive ecology for economy solutions. We are on the air three times each week on Channel 10, Monday at 9.30 p.m., Tuesday at 7.30 a.m., and Saturday at 3.30 p.m. Let us know what you think. Tweet us at VA Green TV. I'm Kate Alexandrova. It's been nice to see you. Thank you.